Howdy, partner. Today, we's gonna learn about some football. No, 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 no. Not the American redneck hillbilly sports. Now, I was talking about some real football now. The one where you kick that damn ball with your foot. God, dog, dag, rabbit, Jim, I'm not talking about them balls, son. I'm talking about the damn sports. Now, you are right. Damn, son, you throwed up your nuts. I told you those savages couldn't be trusted. All right, European, European soccer explained for this guy. Let's do it. I hate watching soccer. They have to bring me. I hate watching soccer. They have to bring the stretcher out at least six times a game. Damn. <laughs> Damn. I thought uh, American football was rough. So I've been wanting to start following soccer for a while now, but as an American, I always found it complicated. Okay, we have an actual American uh, explaining this to us. Not like how they play. Most three-year-olds can kind of understand more or less how it works. I just mean how everything kind of works in Europe. You know, I would follow the World Cup, and I'd root for the United States if they made it. And then I'd root for Iceland because clearly they've all been practicing that clapping, and they're really good at it. But that only happens once every four years. Did he just say they practiced the clapping? So I'd sing that they made it. And then I'd root for Iceland because... Clearly, they've all been practicing that clapping, and they're really good at it. But that only happens once every four years. So I turn on my TV, and it would be a, like a random game, like Parma versus Bologna. And first, I'd make sure that I wasn't watching the Food Network. But Bologna? Bologna? Is that a country? Game, like Parma versus Bologna. And like Parmesan cheese? Somebody's going to cuss me out in the comments. And first, I'd make sure that I wasn't watching the Food Network, but then... <laughs> I had no frame of reference for this game. Like, are these teams good? You know, is this a big game? Which one of these guys is Pele? You know, I, I didn't know. And I had all these other questions. Like, you know, why, why are teams getting kicked out of leagues? Why are they all rolling around on the ground so much? How are guys getting traded to different countries? And why, why does everybody in the stands have a scarf? So a few months ago, I... You can get traded to different countries? I tried to start figuring it all out and I started watching some matches. That's the first thing. They aren't soccer games. They are football matches. And I bought FIFA for my Xbox, and I bought a scarf and a Vuvuzela because that's like the rules or something. So anyway, this is all the info that I wish I'd known a year ago. This is my crash course of translating soccer into American. I'm going to assume that you kind of know the rules. The biggest difference between American sports is how... You assumed wrong, buddy. Offsides works and the clock. Lots of people get upset about the clock. It goes up instead of down. Get over yourself. It doesn't really matter. Americans also get mad because the clock doesn't stop and games pretty much end whenever the ref feels like it. Mm -hmm. And you actually adjust to this pretty quickly. The game's an hour and a half long. You'll have your chances to score. And if you can't score, then it's not the clock's fault. I'm sorry I keep pausing it already, but it, he said the game's over when the ref is ready for the game to be over. But then he said it lasts an hour and a half. So which is it? Some people, and, and when I say people, I'm referring both to discussions I've had with other Americans as well as like myself six years ago. So people think soccer is too slow. And when Americans look at a soccer field, something in our minds, we think that it's like playing hockey or playing basketball just on a big grass field. And in those sports, guys like go full tilt a lot, like most of the game. So when two players are just standing there passing the ball back and forth, we wonder, like, why aren't they trying to move forward? Just go. And on the other side, we expect the defenders to be attacking the guy with the ball rather than just standing five feet back and letting him do what he's doing. The key difference is that soccer fields are much, sorry, football pitches are much larger than basketball courts and hockey rinks. God. And if you try to full court press for the whole soccer game, you would be exhausted and you would probably lose. See, the, the pace of a soccer game is actually much closer to baseball. Most of the game is going to consist of guys just slowly. 
Okay, I thought my video went out for a second. Really passing the ball around, real peaceful. And then it's going to be all of a sudden followed by these short bursts of extremely fast action. Basketball players, it's estimated, run an average of two and a half miles during a game. Soccer players can run seven, if not ten miles during one game. And remember, you only have three subs games, so most of these players will be playing the whole game. One thing Americans will appreciate is that other than halftime, there are no commercials. So it's like the anti-NFL, which is great. Wow. It also means that no matter where the ball is, both teams are always potentially about 30 seconds away from scoring, which creates this kind of constant tension. It also creates a scenario where you can't ever really run to the bathroom or get a drink. Soccer players seem to have a reputation for being lazy in the U.S. because they don't always pop right back up after going to ground and get right back into play. Certainly some players do embellish things and some go over the top, but I don't really think that on the whole it's quite the issue that people make it out to be. So they get made fun of in Europe too. So here's a fun experiment to try the next time you have a few minutes. <laughs> it's not surprising. So the American soccer players <laughs> get made fun of all the time in America and in Europe <laughs> because they're lazy. <laughs> now why do I believe that? Why do I believe that about Americans? Go to like a local field and then quickly jog laps around that field for like 10 minutes mm -hmm. and then suddenly sprint down the middle of the field as fast as you can. And when you're halfway up the field, while you're still sprinting, have one of your friends to shove you over onto the ground. And if you can pop right back up and keep sprinting, then you can keep complaining about those guys. A lot of the time, they're just taking a little rest and everyone will either just keep playing around them or both teams will be a little tired, so who cares? Somebody just call me. Someone one will either just keep playing around them or both teams will be a little tired, so who cares? It's not a Matthew Riley novel out there. The other reason for guys slowly passing the ball around is that one of the strategies currently employed by most teams is to just to maintain possession as much as possible. Obviously, this is no different in American football or why Russia is really good at hockey. The other team can't score when you have the ball. So teams will just pass the ball back and forth and even pass it back to their own goalie because it's better to go backwards with the ball than to maybe make a risky pass and let the other team have the ball. On occasion, you'll see a team make like 50 passes without the other team touching the ball, which can take a really long time, but then they'll go down and they'll... ...score, and that's let the other team have the ball. On occasion, you'll see a team make like 50 passes without the other team touching the ball, which can take a really long time, but then they'll go. All right, guys. Um, I mean, I'm enjoying it because I'm learning something, but I'm sure you guys are getting a little bored. Hopefully, uh, this will pick up a little bit. Go down and they'll score, and that's like as good as it gets. It's all about waiting for the precise moment for things to align and then all going together at the right moment. In terms of like positioning and formations, you'll usually have three or four numbers, like 4-4-2, four, four, or 4-3-3, four, three, three, or 4-2-3-1. These numbers will always add up to 10, and then the goalie is just assumed. Different positions include the center backs, who will just stay as defenders, and then the full backs are both the left and the right back, who will defend, but then they'll also usually join the attack as well. And then we have midfielders, like a center midfielder, who can go both ways. Um, a center attacking midfielder or a center defending midfielder. And then up front, we have like a left wing and a right wing, sometimes a center forward and a striker up front who will, it's his job to just score goals. I've heard of uh, people in, in some video comments uh, mention the word striker. One thing I'll mention that makes it easy to kind of get into soccer is that you can watch, legally watch, some old matches on YouTube. Um, this is unlike American sports. Like, why isn't there a website that I can go to to watch any game, like an iTunes for sports? So, like, I can pay $2 to watch any game in history. Like, all these games are on tape somewhere. They exist. But I can't watch a game in the 1986 World Series unless an international pandemic shuts down the world and there's no sports. And they just happen to put it on NBC or something. Like, come on. So, anyway. Um, is he for real? Like, so I, I couldn't go back and watch a game from like 10 years ago easily so keeping the ball and attacking is referred to as positive football you're always trying to move forward this is what most 
teams do. This is what people like to watch a little more. It's kind of exciting. It's more exciting to watch that way. But of course, there's always a yin to the yang. So the yin is this guy named Jose Mourinho. And he basically says, I don't want the ball. I'm going to stand back with my players in front of my goal, and you're not going to score. And then every once in a while, when you're falling asleep and all your players are up in my zone, we're going to steal the ball and we're going to run down and score, which sounds a little bit risky, except that it actually does work if you do it well. Jose's considered one of the best managers there is, and he has the trophies to back it up. He's won plenty of big tournaments with teams that I'm told if you tried to have that team keep the ball the whole time, like most coaches would, they would have been destroyed. They were too old and they just would have got worn out and wiped out. But but by playing this negative defensive strategy, they were able to win. And despite this, teams that employ the strategy seem to get a bad rap for playing negative as opposed to positive football because keeping the ball seems to be the end thing right now. So obviously there's more thought that goes into into it than I've described here. Like Diego Simeone and Atletico Madrid has been using this negative strategy for years and they've been successful with it. On the flip side, the guys who've risen to the top playing possession football are also widely sought after. Two of the most well-known coaches right now are Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola. And I highly recommend watching the series All or Nothing about Manchester City on Amazon Prime. It's about Guardiola's team a few years ago. And it's, it's quite clear from interviews with these guys that they're you know, quite thoughtful and well-traveled. I couldn't... I might check that out. See what the name of it's called. About Manchester City on Amazon Prime. It's about Guardiola's team a few years ago. Or not Flop and Pep Guardiola. And I highly recommend watching the series All or Nothing about Manchester City. You guys let me know if you've seen the uh, series All or Nothing. And let me know what it's about and if it's uh, any good. Which I'm, I'm sure it is. This guy says it's good. So um, I may throw that on the Patreon. Go check that out on the Patreon soon on Amazon Prime. It's about Guardiola's team a few years ago. And it's, it's quite clear from interviews with these guys that they're you know, quite thoughtful and well-traveled. I couldn't name a single baseball manager who can speak three languages. So speaking of Manchester City, they play in England. There are four main football countries in Europe. There's England, Spain, Germany, and Italy. England has the Premier League, Spain has La Liga, Germany has the Bundesliga, and Italy has Serie A. So to take one country, they're all the same, but to take one country, England, the Premier League consists of 20 teams. Every team plays every other team, once at home and once away, and these leagues don't have playoffs. You get three points for a win, one for a tie. The team with the most points at the end of the season wins. And oh. this can and has come down to the final day of the season before. In the U.S., our leagues pretty much have the same teams every year. So if you suck, and even if you start to lose on purpose, you actually get rewarded with the top draft pick the next year. If you finish in last place in one of these leagues, they literally kick you out of the league. But they call it relegation. What? The whole team can get kicked out of the league? Because that's a nicer sounding word. Before we keep going, here's a quick aside on the MLS. Major League Soccer is the top league in the United States. It's different in many ways than the European leagues. There's no relegation, so the teams do stay the same from year to year, and there is a salary cap. Talent-wise, I guess globally speaking, it seems to be an okay league, but certainly not on par with any of the European leagues. So under the Premier League, which is at the top, under them is a league called the English Football League Championship. The three teams who finish at the bottom of the Premier League are relegated to the championship for the next season and replaced by three teams from the championship. The bottom three teams in the championship are relegated to League One. The bottom three in League One are relegated to League Two, whose losers go to the National League, whose losers are... Um, no, nobody really cares about them except their moms at this part, but you get the <laughs> idea. Unless you really get into the soccer, you'll never hear about anything below the Premier League again. But God knows if... Well, all right, wait, wait, wait. So the whole... T yeah, he said the whole team. So three teams go down a league every year. The worst teams of the season. <laughs> that is horrible. So, like... So if you suck as a team for a whole season, like, your money's, like, gone. Because I'm assuming... Uh, the Premier League and the EFL and down to the National League, there's uh, there's huge differences in 
what they pay you. <laughs> just so you're aware of what's happening down there. This system does a few things. First off, just because you're near the bottom of the standings, your games can still be extremely important. They still count because you're not trying to win the league anymore, but now you're trying to literally stay in the league. And oh. the higher the league you're in, the higher the check you get from TV contracts. So it's kind of a big deal. It also creates this kind of theoretical meritocracy where you could start a team with a bunch of guys anywhere in the country, get into a kind of a tiny league, and then ultimately work your way up to the Premier League. Oh, and- wow. Okay. So, like, anybody could could uh, come up with a, with a, a team and start in the lower leagues, and if they're really, really good, they move up and could eventually get to the Premier League. That's all right there, man. It's like, that's, that's cool. That's crazy. In reality, that'd be like trying to take a single-A baseball team and work your way up to the majors while the other better teams with bigger pocketbooks are trying to buy all your best players the whole way. But for the teams at the top, just winning the Premier League sounds pretty easy. You're, you're playing maybe one game a week. But that's the catch. There's other things going on here. So there's also the Carabao Cup, which is a tournament open to the top four leagues in England. And then there's the FA Cup, which has been going on since, like, forever, that it's literally open to every, like, team in England. So over 700 teams entered this one tournament last year. 700 like, imagine teams? Imagine every major and minor league baseball team had one giant tournament. So could any team win? Yes, they could. Will the small teams upset the bigger teams? At some point, maybe a few will. But is it likely that a non-Premier League team is going to win? No, probably not. So more fun to think about in theory than practically, I guess. The final tournament is the, the big one. Like, what if we could find the best team in Europe? And I don't mean like each country gets a team. That's the European Championship that happens every four years. This, I'm talking about the league clubs. So the best teams in, from all over Europe from 55 different countries, battle it out each year. This is the UEFA Champions League. So as a side note on these acronyms here, FIFA is the organization that runs like big international tournaments, like the World Cup, and they help to coordinate things across different regions. If you're an American, you probably heard of FIFA because somebody on SportsCenter mentioned somebody that was involved with some kind of corruption investigation. I've only heard of it because of the EA Sports game or something. Anyway, within FIFA, the world is divided into six different regions. UEFA is Europe. That's where, like, the best players go. CONCACAF, you may have heard of, because that's what the U.S. is in, the Confederation of North, Central, American, and Caribbean Association Football, which is short and sweet. And then there's, like, the rest of the world. And each one of these groups has tournaments with national teams and their league clubs, like the CONCACAF Champions League and the UEFA Champions League. And these are called like the Champions League, but really it's just a tournament. So the UEFA Champions League is played in conjunction with the UEFA Europa League, which is kind of like the NCAA and NIT basketball tournaments, but with a bit of a twist. They play the qualifying rounds for the Champions League first. So if you get knocked out of the big boy tournament, but you finish high enough, you can just move down into the Europa League and try to win that. And I won't get into the qualifying, but typically you're going to have teams that you may have heard of as a as an American, like Manchester City, Liverpool, Manchester United, Tottenham Hotspur. From Spain, they'd probably be Barcelona and Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid. Serie A from Italy will have Juventus and Inter and Roma and Atalanta. Germany is pretty much dominated by Borussia Dortmund and Bayern Munich. And then there's other popular teams like Paris Saint-Germain from France and Lyon. So which team is that guy that uh, always, uh, Christian Ronaldo, I think his name is? What team is he on? Um, I have no clue. I've seen him a few times, but I never really recognized his jersey or anything. From France and Ajax from the Netherlands. And then you throw in a few Russian teams and you're ready to party. So For an American, this dude knows his, for real back to the Premier League, you remember how your team's playing that kind of standard 38-game schedule. So now, also at the same time, you're competing in the Premier League, the Carabao Cup, the FA Cup, and the Champions League. And there's like a bunch of other small one-off games happening too. So even if you have the best team, you're... Dude, did these guys ever get a break? 
They're getting paid though. Good God, they're getting paid. But I imagine they are freaking exhausted at the uh, end of the season. They're still probably not going to win all these tournaments just because of the wear and tear. If you can win three trophies in a year, that's like special. That's called a treble. If you win four, that's called a quadruple, but that's pretty rare. And so the biggest payday is for winning your league. Anybody ever won a quadruple? You guys know? All four of them? Although I, for some reason, find the Champions League is hard to beat for excitement. So even though you can, soccer teams tend to trade players less than they do in the U.S. Rather, teams will just buy players from their current club. So a contract is going to include your salary, obviously, but also something called a release clause, which is a fee that would go to the current club for that player. While any team could negotiate a transfer fee with a player's current club, a release clause takes that current team just out of negotiations altogether. So a baseball player, unhappy with the situation, he could demand a trade, and they might trade him and he'd be happy. But if they refuse to trade him, then he's kind of stuck. Whereas a soccer player could just find another team willing to pay that release clause. And once a team agrees to pay the clause, then they can just negotiate directly with that player. Obviously, the better player, the higher the fee is going to be, so the current club can go out and find a reasonable replacement. Another big difference is that while most sports in the U.S. have a trade deadline, and that's followed by a few weeks afterward where players cannot move to another team, soccer is kind of the opposite. So most of the time, you cannot move to another team. There are two periods a year called transfer windows that you can move during. So usually before and then halfway through the season. And you can sign a new contract for another team whenever, but you can't actually start playing for them until that next transfer window. And the last thing in terms of contracts is that in the U.S., most leagues have a draft, but soccer is pretty much like the Wild West. So teams will sign players, or I should say kids, like into their youth academy very young, like 10, 8 years old. And smaller what? teams who find a really good player could also include something called a sell Wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, 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 let me back up. As most leagues have a draft, but soccer is pretty much like the Wild West. So teams will sign players, or I should say kids, like into their youth academy very young, like 10. When he says teams will sign kids, do they, do they get any money uh, when they sign with a team at 10 years old? It's wild. 10, 8 years old. And smaller teams who find a really good player could also include something called a sell-on clause when selling a player to a larger team that says if the team buying that player turns around and sells the player again to an even bigger club, then that original team will get a percentage what? of that secondary sale. Wow. All right, so if you're still here at this point, you probably want more. So what's next? There are like an unlimited number of top or best goal compilations on YouTube, which are kind of interesting in the sense that you can actually show you know, new people to soccer the potential that the game has. Lots of Americans. Does it bother you guys uh, in the United Kingdom and in Europe in general that he keeps referring to it as soccer? Wondering. Exposure to soccer is like the women's world or the potential that the game has. Lots of Americans' exposure to soccer is like the Women's World Cup, and obviously we have a great team there, but you never really get to see that what different strategies look like. Like, look up Barcelona Tiki Taka videos. You won't regret that. They make grown men look like children. As I mentioned, the All or Nothing series on Man City is great if you have Amazon Prime, and obviously just watching games is good. FIFA TV has a YouTube channel that has lots of international matches. Or just look on YouTube for full football matches. You're smart, you'll find them. Um, UEFA TV has old Champions League matches. I think you might have to register, but it's free. You'll probably want to follow BR's football channel on YouTube. They have a lot of good stuff, including this very funny series called The Champions, which I'd probably wait a little bit until you learn a little more about the uh, top players before watching that. One place I always turn to when trying to learn a new sport is video games. So FIFA would probably help. Um, although the big caveat there is that it has horrible reviews. That said, is if you're just trying to learn the rules, like basic tactics and which players are on which teams and who plays where, I would say it's been pretty helpful for me. 
most of the negativity toward the game is the for the online, the FIFA Ultimate Team mode, where you end up paying for players for your team. But if you just avoid that and then like stick to playing against the AI, then you should be okay. The only thing I hesitate to do is play as Barcelona because you could control Leo Messi, and like, who am I to tell God what? I've heard of Messi. Messi's like the goat, right? One of the football videos I did, I think the guy Messi was in there like just a ton. What to do? So Barcelona, because you could control Leo Messi, and like, who am I to tell God what to do? So I, I usually avoid that part. The alternative. <laughs> did he just refer to Messi as the football god? <laughs> here it would be a game called Pez which I've heard good things about although it doesn't have licensing for many of the teams so jerseys will look different and team names will be slightly off which I guess might be confusing to someone new and I think FIFA's player faces are a bit more recognizable too. News wise there's coverage like everywhere of soccer although I do enjoy the site onefootball.com which brings us to the sponsor of today's video which is there's no sponsor for today's video. Um <laughs> I just make these videos to push the boundaries of PowerPoint and see how mad I can make myself. Anyway, hopefully that helps somewhat. You're now ready to venture off beyond the coasts of the United States and become an even bigger soccer fan. Just if, you, if you're leaving the U.S., call it football. They get mad if you call it soccer. Anyway, good luck. Yeah, sorry about the camera, guys. I uh, hate when the battery dies and I don't realize it. Well, um, good God. All right, so like I said, the only two football players that I could name off the top of my head is the the Ronaldo dude and now the Mess, Messi dude. I, I don't know how you guys keep up with all those teams. They said there's he said there's like 700 teams in England alone. 700 teams just in England. Good gosh! And there's four four. What do you say? All right, no no no. There's 700 team. Yeah, there's 700 teams in England and. Oh God, there's multiple leagues. And then, oh my God, it, this is a head full. Oh my God. Maybe I just need to start off by watching just a game. Just watch a game. So that's what I'm going to do. If y'all would like recommend an exciting game to watch. Anything else you think I should know as far as the basics and how the rules and all that goes, let me know in the comments. And see you guys next time. Thanks.